the ongoing political tug of war between the European Union and Hungary entered a new phase this month after the bloc's parliament declared the country, quote, no longer a fully functioning democracy and voted to suspend around seven and a half billion dollars in funding until it tows a more democratic line. The EU is accusing Hungary through Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his right-wing ruling Fidesz party of systematically dismantling the rule of law and presiding over a climate of corruption. That's a lot of money to lose by any standard. So will Hungary continue to be a belligerent thorn in the EU side or quietly comply by the November deadline and make the reforms demanded by the bloc? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Hazem Seeker. Earlier this year, the EU beefed up its legal mechanisms to be able to withhold funds from countries it says fall short of its standards of democracy. Hungary, which the European Parliament called, quote, an electoral autocracy after voting in favor of freezing funds this month, is the first country to be subject to the so-called cash for democracy. Its Eastern European ally, Poland, has also been sanctioned, both accused of flouting EU liberal democratic principles. But will this move by the bloc be enough to bring Hungary back into the fold? Well, joining us now in the studio to talk more about this, Thomas Lorman, lecturer in the history of Central Europe and expert on the Hungarian political landscape at University College London. From Budapest, we have Andras Laszlo, former advisor to the ruling Fidesz party. And joining us from Belgrade, Strainja Subotic, researcher at the European Policy Center. Good to have you all with us. So, um, Thomas, let me start with you. This vote was seen as largely symbolic and is not going to change the course of EU decision making at this point. So, I guess it begs the question of what, what purpose um, it serves and what effect it's going to have. Well, I think it's going to have some effect because the intention of the European Union at the moment is to put some pressure on Hungary, partly to achieve reforms within the country that will happen but also to satisfy domestic critics uh, within the European Union and across Europe who have been increasingly vociferous in their criticisms of Hungary ever since 2010, when Viktor Orban won his second election, became prime minister for a second time. And Orban, since 2010, has been very clear that he wants to adopt unorthodox policies to fix various crises to do things in his own way with solutions that are that he believes are appropriate to Hungary. Whereas the EU wants ever closer unity, conformity, and is concerned about what Orban is doing. So this is an attempt by the EU to, uh, if you like, slap Orban across the, the wrists and get him to moderate his policies. Well, Orban himself has been very dismissive of this decision, and uh, we're going to hear from him now, hear what he said on that. With regard to the European Parliament decision, I find it funny. We are not laughing for the sole reason that this is becoming boring. This is a boring joke. They are doing this for the third or fourth time, accepting a resolution that condemns Hungary. But let me repeat, they are increasingly doing this to amuse themselves. We no longer care about this at all. So let me, let me turn to uh, Andras Laszlo, um, former advisor to um, Orban's party. Um, he's, he's saying that this is really pointless, it's not going to have any effect at all. But is this just bluster um, from the Hungarian prime minister? Should, should he be more concerned, really? What the Hungarian prime minister was referring to were previous, par previous reports adopted by the European parliament uh, for some reason, always near our uh, election dates, both in 2014, we had elections and there was a European parliamentary report in 2013. We had elections in 2018. Then again, we had a European parliamentary report. And now that we had elections in 2022, yet again, we have a report by the European Parliament. There is a leftist liberal majority in the European Parliament. So you're saying this is politically Europe. motivated? Oh, yeah. Well, the European Parliament is a political body and it has a leftist liberal majority uh, in the in the chamber. So obviously they are playing their political games uh, when they when the left loses in Hungary, then the European left is upset and they're showing solidarity. 
Uh, there is nothing in this report which has any kind of novelty. There has been nothing which has happened which warranted a, a resolution or a debate on Hungary, other than the fact that Viktor Orban and the Conservative Alliance won the elections again and already to uh, sit down and negotiate with the European Commission about European funds. Well, you say this is nothing new, but the report does uh, detail specific instances of where they feel Hungary has been backsliding uh, on, on democracy in terms of, of how it treats uh, uh, the, the media, in terms of uh, judicial independence uh, and so on. What do you have to say to, to those specific accusations? Well, in 2018, we had national elections and Fidesz and the Christian Democrats won with a considerable majority. Uh, then there was all kind of problems which you mentioned. Then in 2019, at European elections, uh, the Conservative Alliance won again. And half a year later, when there were municipal elections and the left carried many cities and mayorships, including the city of Budapest, then all of a sudden the media landscape, the, the, the system of the judicial system, uh, etc., all the usual critics, all of a sudden they didn't matter and the left could win elections. So, and then there were no problems about uh, campaign rules or election rules. It's always a problem when the right wins the elections. Uh, Straina Subatic, I know others will say this, as has been said, that this is symbolically important. Um, but what do you say to that criticism uh, that this is um, um, the coming from many right-wing MEPs, um, that these are just, a lot of this is, is subject, subjective and, and politically biased? I think it's uh, dangerous how Prime Minister Orban refers to European Parliament, because European Parliament is one of the pillars of the EU and represents uh, European citizens, including the Hungarian ones. So any kind of disagreement with the European Parliament uh, should uh, have a, a dose of civility and uh, open-mindedness, even when they disagree. I think this sends a dangerous message not only to EU member states, but also to candidate countries such as Serbia and now we see uh, Ukraine. Because uh, even in, during the enlargement process, uh, the European Parliament issues uh, annual, annual reports and uh, our leaders as well can argue against the European Parliament and uh, can harshly criticizing it because they can argue that even member states such as Hungary are doing it. Why shouldn't we? So I'm just saying that whatever Orban says uh, is primarily aimed at its domestic, uh, at his domestic audience, primarily Hungarians. But uh, the spillover effect is existent and people in Serbia uh, are listening to what Orban is saying. And interestingly, Hungary is a increasing in popularity, considering that uh, the ideology of Orban is similar to the one uh, shared by uh, uh, the Serbian uh, president. Well, we're going to hear a little bit more from the EU now, um, and we're going to play this from um, Johannes Hahn, the EU commissioner. The commission is uh, proposing measures to the Council for the protection of the union budget against breaches of the principles of the rule of law in Hungary. And finally, shortcomings in the anti-corruption framework. The Commission proposes a suspension of 65% of the commitments for three operational programs under cohesion policy, amounting to an estimated uh, amount of uh, 7.5 billion euro. What effect, what practical effect is this going to have, Thomas, on the... Uh, uh inside Hungary, this denial of, of, of funds? Well, there is this divide. The European Parliament is very outspoken. And it has been arguing, along with some academics and observers, that Hungary is no longer a democracy. The European Commission has to actually explain what the precise criticisms are. And it's actually quite difficult when they tried to pin down exactly what they don't like about Hungary to find things which are unique to Hungary and don't exist in other European countries, for example, in Italy or France. So they've gone for a series of very narrow observations about courts and transparency, and the Hungarian government will respond, I suspect, in fact, they've already made moves in this direction, to address some of those very specific concerns about appointments and transparency. The larger issue, which is whether the Hungarian political system can be dramatically reformed by these, uh, by these uh, threats and financial uh, measures, I think is absolutely not going to happen. There will be a deal. Neither the European Union or Hungary wants 
a major clash. This really should have been avoided earlier by, by, by being able to deal with specific issues that the Commission can raises. Because ultimately, Orban has a particular vision of the country and a particular way of doing politics. He's not going to change that. And I think it's unrealistic for him to do that. In fact, he'll gain political popularity from appearing to stand up to the European Union. He would lose popularity if these financial punishments are imposed. He knows that the Hungarian economy is in a tough situation like the rest of Europe. So there has to be a deal and there will be a deal. Uh, I'm pretty confident about that. All right, we'll put that to our other guests in a moment. But just, just to give you a little bit of background um, on this mechanism that the EU has. The EU introduced the new financial sanction two years ago precisely in response to what it says amounts to the undermining of democracy in Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban controlled courts, media, NGOs, and academia, as well as restricting the rights of migrants, gays, and women during more than a decade in power. So, uh, Andras, to... To uh, Thomas's point there, that um, there's likely to be some sort of a compromise. Well, I partially agree with Thomas Lorman, uh, just said that there's no specific law uh, that the European Commission can pinpoint that, well, this one should be changed, and that's the breach of uh, EU treaties. There's no such thing. That's why the European Parliament and also the European Commission comes up with language like threats and risks and systemic problems because there's no uh, particular law they can point to. So I think this is very dishonest from both the European Parliament and the Commission. Uh, they know that this is a decision which has finally has to be taken at council level, so by the governments of EU member states. Uh, this process has been initiated in 2018, and there has been no conclusive results on it since then, so four years now. Uh, specifically because member states all also know what was also mentioned already is that, well, they have very similar laws in many, in many situations, uh, whether it's media, judiciary or else. So uh, their problem is more like what was said is, is political direction. The Hungarian government is a conservative government. It says no to uh, a lot of issues where it sees that its, um, its national interests are being uh, um, impeded on. That includes illegal immigration, that includes uh, LGBT lobbying in schools and kindergartens, or right now, whether Hungary is ready to support more uh, sanctions on Russian energy. Obviously, Hungary doesn't want that. And uh, those who want more power in Brussels, that includes both the European Parliament and the European Commission, they are upset and they are trying to remove or weaken uh, the conservative government. Strainia, what's your view on this um, possibility of, of some sort of an agreement between the EU and, and Hungary? Um, are, they, are the EU countries having to tread a careful line here around Hungary because of the need to win their uh, agreement on, on, on major decisions? How big a role is that going to play in this and in terms of how far they can go? Considering that the, there is an ongoing war in Ukraine and considering how Hungary is uh, just neighboring uh, Ukraine, and hasn't been too cooperative when it comes to uh, selecting uh, uh, extensive uh, sanctioning packages against Russia. I do believe that many member states will adopt this uh, realist perspective and argue that uh, this is time to uh, work together and strengthen the geostrategic position of Europe. And uh, of course, Hungary will be one of the essential uh, pieces of puzzle when it comes to achieving this goal. So therefore, I do believe that many member states will have geopolitics in mind when it comes to uh, adopting any potential uh, uh, mechanisms or uh, decisions which might freeze uh, uh, the funds for Hungary. And therefore, I do believe that uh, they won't uh, eagerly jump uh, to vote against Hungary. But at the same time, I, I don't see big countries such as Germany or France uh, at the same time supporting uh, openly Hungary, because if Hungary uh, slips through this issue uh, without any harm, without uh, any consequence, uh, it will send the message that uh, any adopted regulations which are supposed to in, uh, impose conditionality will actually be meaningless in practice. So therefore, I do believe that this is a historic moment. We'll have three more months to see what will happen. But uh, uh, when it comes to compromise deal, I would conclude that geopolitics uh, are likely to uh, play a relevant role. All right, we're going to uh, put up a graphic now that deals with the um, issue of uh, corruption in Hungary. Now, according to Transparency International's 2021 Western Europe and European Union Corruption Perceptions Index, 
Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania remain the worst performers in the European region. Denmark has been joined by Finland at the top of the CPI, followed by Norway, Sweden, as least corrupt countries. So on that point then, um, Thomas, is, is, uh, is, is Hungary getting a sort of bum rap, if I can put it that way, that, they, that, they're, that they're too, that there are other countries who, who have problems with corruption, as we just outlined there. Why is, why is Hungary getting all the attention? Partly it's, it's because there is corruption in Hungary. In fact, it was embedded into the system during the communist regime, and it's continued with each government since, because it's extremely hard to remove and even harder to define. Because what is the difference between corruption, favoritism, nepotism, politicization, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, the critical problem here is that Hungary has been very bad at making its case. It had to rebuild its diplomacy in the last 32 years, uh, from scratch after the communist regime collapsed, it's not taken it, uh, the idea of making its case particularly seriously. And actually, it's been frequently outmaneuvered and criticized. It is getting better, and there's some very good people. The foreign ministry itself is one of the hard line uh, elements of the Hungarian government. That they don't really think that there's a need to persuade the West uh, of, of that Hungary is doing its best. And because of that PR failure, Hungary has been singled out, when in reality, I don't think the situation vis-a-vis -vis corruption in Hungary is, is significantly worse than anywhere else in the, in the region. Um, so it, it's unfortunately, partly it's about deep historical problems, but partly it's about Hungary not being able to make the case about corruption, about democracy, uh, in a persuasive way in the European Union and across Europe that would deflect some of this criticism and prevent these problems emerging. It really is unfortunate that Hungary hasn't won over its friends uh, and made enough friends in the European Union, and we have to hope that that will improve. Actually, there are signs in the last few weeks that Hungary is starting to launch a bit of a charm offensive. Uh, but Orban still throws out his rhetorical bombs uh, that annoys people and makes it difficult for Hungary to make its case and persuade people that actually this is not an autocracy, it's not a completely corrupt country, it is a working partner of the European Union, and actually, I hopefully, will remain that way into the future. All right, let's put some of that then to Andras then. What, what, what is the Hungarian government doing then to address these concerns of, of uh, corruption uh, in, in the government? Well, the government has just put forward a um, list of measures, I believe, of 17 items which it proposed of doing towards the European Commission in order to come to an agreement on the use of EU funds. In addition to what was just said by Thomas Norman, I would add that um, in Hungary, if you look at charts, which is not corruption perception index, because as the name says, it's perception. But if you look at raw, concrete uh, data, such as economic data, GDP growth or other, you see that there's no significant difference in growth uh, from central... Uh, when looking at Central European countries like the Visegrad countries. So growth is very similar, uh, despite corruption perception being very different. Also, if you compare Central Europe or Hungarian uh, GDP data uh, with the Eurozone average, you see that the growth is significantly higher than the Eurozone area. So there's a perception of corruption because the Hungarian left and the European left has been using corruption as their main uh, item of attack against uh, the Fidesz government. So perception for this reason is, uh, is above average. But if you look at the economic data, the economic output performance, right. then you see that, in fact, Hungarian economy is well, doing may, really well. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Andras. That may be the case, but the issue here is about corruption, not, not economic growth. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a separate when, where there is corruption, there's no investment and there's no growth because the money gets lost in the system and people don't want to invest in a corrupt country, in a corrupt economy. If there's economic output, if there's willingness for foreign direct investment, which there is, we've had record years in the past years, despite uh, the pandemic, uh, it's really, uh, you have to look at the, the facts. What is the economic output? Because if there is above average corruption, that has to show on economic data as well, and it doesn't. All right, let's put that to uh, Strainia then. Is, is that um, the economic growth, is that evidence that, that uh, the, this whole issue of corruption is, is, is overblown? What's your view on that? 
Uh, I'd like to say that corruption is not, not just about economy, but it's actually widespread and cross-sectoral. If you take a look at the list that the European Parliament has uh, provided in its resolution, it talks about uh, uh, citizens' rights, uh, academic freedoms, and so on. I mean, as long as we have Central European University being kicked out uh, uh, for uh, somewhat reasons known only to Orban, you can uh, hardly argue that this is a practice existing uh, in other member states. This showcases that, therefore, that the very idea of free thought is actually what is being uh, limited in Hungary. And we all know that the free thought is actually the most dangerous to uh, a, a regime such as uh, a hybrid regimes, which is labeled by the Freedom House. Uh, and uh, as, as such, these uh, are dangerous because they have elements in state capture, meaning that actually the political party in charge is actually becoming the state. So the line between the party system and the state system are getting uh, blurred. And I'm insisting on this because this is a similar th uh, trend uh, we are actually uh, seeing uh, ongoing in Serbia. So therefore, th considering that uh, uh, universities are being kicked out from Hungary, uh, one can hardly expect uh, Hungary to be able to make a persuasive case uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, Thomas, to what, to what extent um... Is if there if the perception is that the EU is pushing Hungary too far on this, what effect is it going to have um, inside Hungary with public opinion? Is this something that Orbán is, is going to capitalize on as, as much as he can? I, well, partly yes. I mean, uh, it certainly plays well in the short term. If there are economic sanctions imposed and that hurts the Hungarian economy, that will be a big problem because Hungary really does want even faster economic growth than it's achieved. In fact, its stated goal is to catch up and even surpass the Western European average. So Orban has based a great deal of his popularity on a promise of real economic success. He first came to power in 2010 out of an earlier economic crisis, and he's determined to keep the economy growing. So he doesn't want these economic punishments. He also doesn't want the impact on foreign investment. He doesn't want... Uh, the, the, the uncertainties which would affect the finance. And really, the, the, the finance people around Orban don't want that either. So I think Orban, although he sometimes is presented as a hard right ideologue, is also a very pragmatic politician who knows how to win elections by keeping Hungary's economy growing. And so he won't allow anything to happen that would seriously derail the economy. For example, he's concerned about sanctions on Russia, in part, really, because he's worried about the economic impact on, on Hungary. So he's a pragmatic politician. Don't underestimate him. He'll, he'll find a way to keep the economy growing because that is a core part of his uh, successful appeal to Hungarians. They know it. He knows it. It won't change. Andras, what's your response to that? I very much agree. Uh, Economic recovery after the 2008 crisis has been left to the Orban government, which took office in 2010. And currently, uh, the Hungarian government is very outspoken against the energy sanctions, which were um, implemented against Russian energy. And the government is very clearly uh, openly talking uh, about uh, a refusal of any further energy sanctions on Russia, because we see uh, Hungarian conservatives see um, these sanctions being very damaging to not only the Hungarian economy, but the whole of the European economy. And it's very difficult to say, oh, uh, we're going to be, we're gonna be um, facing Russia and we're going to be uh, standing up for Ukraine when uh, there's going to be social tension. There are already protests around uh, Europe because of people being unable to pay their bills, because of small businesses having to close. Uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, crisis, both energy crisis and economic crisis, is something the Hungarian government absolutely wants to avoid for, uh, for national uh, reasons and also because we are very much connected to your European economy, so we don't want to see the Europe European economy go down either. Strainia, just in the minute or so that we've got left here, how, how do you see this playing out then? Well, for Hungary to succeed in defending its case, it needs a blocking minority in the council when the time arrives. For this minority to be gathered, it needs at least four member states, and uh, which contain 35% of population. I've actually done my calculations, and uh, if we expect all those pro-value EU member states to vote against Hungary, you can hardly expect Hungary to expect uh, that many countries, actually, which would contain 35 member states. So therefore, unless any uh, changes, notable changes are done on the ground, 
unless Hungary makes some concessions and uh, uh, st starts playing more cooperatively in terms of geopolitics. There is actually quite a good chance with the quali qualified majority voting for the uh, member states actually to start freezing for the first time these funds. However, as I mentioned, these, this is only conditional upon uh, Hungary's willingness to start cooperating in the next uh, a uh, few months. So I do believe this is a historical moment uh, and because this uh, opens the door to avoid unanimity, which was a hurdle for activating uh, Article 7, and actually to set a good example for other member states to start behaving uh, uh, as they should according to treaties by respecting rule of law and fundamental rights. And all right, and on that we're going to have to leave it. Thank you very much to all three of you. Uh, Andras Laszlo, Straina Subotic, and uh, Thomas Lohmann joining me here in the studio. Thanks very much for being on Roundtable. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and all of the team here, goodbye and thanks for watching.